Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first ever virtual MAPS event. I'm Catherine Tripp, the coordinator for MAPS, and I am speaking on behalf of everyone on the committee by saying how thrilled we are to have you all attend this evening's events. Last spring, when the campus closed, we, the committee members, were unsure whether transitioning our program to a remote virtual format would be well received by students and the community members alike. Having over 400 people sign up to attend this evening's event is thrilling and speaks loudly to the fact that relevant science information is important and it's valued by those of us living in this great Central Valley. So again, thank you and welcome. It is our wish that this event remain interactive. So we welcome your questions. And should you wish to participate, please post your questions in the chat box on your computer. Our speaker will take breaks between topics to answer them. Should we accidentally miss yours, please post it again as the presentation comes to an end. And we will try to include it. Please watch the MAPS page for future events and share the link with your friends. Save the date, October 30th, we are gonna have um, people from the Stanislaus County Office of Health Organization, the epidemiology team, is coming to discuss how COVID is impacting the Central Valley. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the first speaker of the fall series. She is one of MJC's own successful and highly respected professors. She is a living testimony to how effective and important community colleges are. After falling through the cracks and dropping out of high school, Erin obtained her GED at a local community college. From there, she transferred to the University of Arizona and attained her BS with a major in microbiology and a minor in chemistry. She completed a PhD program right after graduation and also at, also at University of Arizona. In her program, she studied pathology, pathogenic bacteriology and specialized in toxin characterization. Always interested in teaching, she decided to pursue a certificate in college teaching, which essentially became her minor in her program. She loves teaching students about infectious diseases and has been at MJC since 2009. In her spare time, she travels, showing and competing with her dogs. She also volunteers with Paws for Friends with her two therapy dogs. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Erin Lucas. Thank you, Kat. Uh, I assume everybody's cheering. This is how this is going to just be now. Uh, we're in the weird days of I can't see any of your faces. I'm talking to a camera. So be welcome to um, throw your questions in chat. As Catherine has alluded, what I kind of took upon myself for this talk was to, to get you guys ready um, so that when the county health people come and talk about COVID in the Central Valley, you kind of have a, um, a better scientific fundamental understanding of infectious diseases, viruses, and how they kind of um, affect us. And so this talk is broken down into three mini talks, realistically. Um, the first little mini talk is all about virology. The second little mini talk is about coronaviruses. And then the third little mini talk is um, vaccine biology, because hey, we're all hearing about vaccines now and that's gonna be really great. So after each little mini talk, I'm gonna stop for questions. And if you have questions, just throw them in the chat and we'll pause for that. And then we'll just go on to the next little topic. I assume that's okay with you. It's not like you can respond. So I'm gonna thumbs up it. Okay, off we go. Uh, our first topic is, is let's all be virologists. Yeah, all right. And, 15 minutes, we're not going to be a virologist, but I want to kind of start us off with what I love best about life science and then also how it brings frustration to life science. And um, oops, it didn't really scroll through. Let's try this again. It's two screens. Um, the blessing is, is that in life science, we don't have a lot of black and whites. 
that doesn't really exist in life science. It's all a series of gray areas. It's just, is it more dark gray or is it more light gray? So while I do love that because it really kind of opens up a lot of possibilities, it can be a source of frustrations. We don't, we try to stay away from words like always or never because then we get backed in the corner and are proved wrong. Um, so you're gonna hear me say more words like often or hardly ever or things like that. So when we take that kind of into consideration and we start with our viruses are, are viruses alive? That should be a black and white question. They either are or they're not, but oh, well, that depends on how you define life, right? What do we see with things that we would determine are living things? They gotta be made of cells. One cell, that's okay. Or MMR cells. Average human is somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 100 trillion cells. And reproduction. So let's talk about cells and reproduction and whether or not viruses kind of fall into those categories. Viruses are not made of cells, period. Now that being said, here's the gray area. They're not made out of cells, but they are organized. Sometimes they're highly organized. Um, if you've ever seen a picture of a virus that infects a bacterial organism, yes, that exists. Um, it basically looks like an alien landing pod that lands on the surface of bacteria and then punches through. So it's very organized. Do they reproduce? Again, eh, no-ish. Uh, if you take a virus, and it doesn't matter what virus we're talking about, Ebola, coronaviruses, whatever, and you stick it on the table and come back some amount of time later, nothing will have happened. There will not be any more viruses on that table than you, when you left. But if a virus gains entry into a host, host cell that it can infect, it will take that host cell over and that host cell will replicate that virus. I mean, a lot. Like if one virus gains entry into a host cell, we're talking 20,000, 30,000, 100,000 new viruses could be made. So it is replicated, but it doesn't replicate. It does have genetic information though, kinda. I mean, it does, but right, lots of gray areas. It absolutely has genetic information. In living organisms, in cellular organisms, um, the genetic information is in the form of DNA, right? Double helix, we all know about that. Some viruses have that particular moiety of uh, DNA. There are DNA viruses, smallpox, DNA virus. Some of them are RNA-based though, like coronaviruses. Things that are living also have growth and development. Do viruses? Eh. No, there's no such thing as a little baby virus that grows up into an adult virus and then gets married and has little baby viruses of its own. But there are viral bits that are not fully assembled inside a host cell that then get assembled and put together and turn into what we would call a mature virion. A virion is an infectious viral particle. So, nah, nah, uh, responds to the environment. Eh. When I get cold, I will put on a coat, maybe some gloves, my hands get cold. Viruses don't do that. They just kind of bounce around randomly until they happen to come into contact with a cell that they can infect. And then they do infect it. And then things happen. So the answer is no. But this is not a hill I'm willing to die on. Um, most scientists, most researchers kind of agree that, yeah, they're not living. But if you wanna argue that, okay, fine. Let's actually talk about the structure though, because that's pertinent information for our discussion. Um, what are viruses made out of? We know they're not made out of cells. They're not made out of cells. All viruses have to have at least two components. They have to have some kind of genetic material whether it be RNA, whether it be DNA, single-stranded, double-stranded, whatever, they have to have something. Then they also have to have a protein coat around it. And that protein is called capsid protein. So it's got a capsid coat around its genetic information. And some viruses, that's all you get. 
It's just, we call those naked viruses, which means virology is fun. Some viruses though, I don't know how I got unmuted, that was fun. Zoom. <laughs> um, some viruses have an extra bit and that bit is called an envelope. And so what an envelope is, is it's a phospholipid bilayer, not a cell, but a phospholipid bilayer over um, its capsid coat. And oftentimes spike proteins are embedded in there. This is the now picture of SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes uh, COVID-19. You can see the red little spikes. Those red little balls are the spike protein and the, what's gray is the envelope. Where did it get that envelope? It's not a cell. It doesn't actually make anything by itself. Envelope viruses are very sneaky. When they leave the cell, they steal a little bit. It's almost like they cloak themselves as they exit the cell with a little bit of the cell's plasma membrane. Sometimes it's a membrane from somewhere else, but oftentimes it's a plasma membrane. So as they exit, they take a little bit of that cell with them with the spike proteins embedded. So that's quite nefarious. How do we come, become infected? How do cells become infected? Uh, by random chance, kind of. First, the virus has to come into contact with a cell it can infect. All viruses have different cells, different species of things that they can infect. And it's very specific. That's why you can't give your cold to your dog and you can't get horse sniffles from your horse. Um, so that's the good news for the most part. But once viruses come into contact with cells that it can infect, they have to have the right lock or the right key to, to wiggle the lock to get into that cell. Once they're inside that cell, they take the cell over. It's like a hostile takeover. They basically convince the cell to stop making new cell stuff. And instead of making new cell stuff, it only makes new viral bits. It constructs viral uh, capsid proteins. It makes the spike proteins. So it stops making its own stuff. And what happens is over time, uh, the cell becomes overwhelmed and it dies. The outcome of viral invasion is cell death. So I've got this little really rudimentary animation of how this happens. So we have our little virus. It's going to come into contact with a host cell that it can infect. Now, oftentimes this interaction between the virus and the host cell um, is facilitated with those spike proteins. Spike proteins really are just a whole bunch of little keys sticking out waiting to get into the right lock. Once the virus gets inside, it's got to take off um, the envelope. If it's still on there, it's got to take off the capsid protein coat. And so now we just have nucleic acid, that genetic material that's inside these host cells. The host cell will replicate it over and over and over. Then the host cell will actually put the viral bits together and you will get more viruses and more viruses and more viruses. And eventually the host cell dies and that host cell has gone away. And all of those new mature virions will be free to infect other cells. So with this kind of idea that these are not made out of cells themselves, but they have organization, they do have genetic materials, how, how do we treat them? What do we treat them with? Um, one of the biggest frustrations um, that I have sometimes is that we all like to reach for the antibiotics right? Because antibiotics cure infectious diseases. Are you infected with something? Take some antibiotics. No, no. Uh, antibiotics are drugs that inhibit some kind of cellular process. So whether it be inhibiting bacterial cell walls or inhibiting protein synthesis, these are drugs that inhibit cellular processes. And viruses are not made out of cells. So antibiotics don't do anything for viruses at all. Um, a, a viral infection will not be treated with antibiotics. Um, a whole different talk we could talk about for a long time is antibiotic resistance, but we'll save that 
we'll save that for next time. But what do we do have? We do have kind of some antivirals, kind of. We're actually not that very good at making antivirals. Um, probably one of the best ones we have that you might be familiar with um, is Tamiflu. And Tamiflu is kind of an antiviral. It is. It, it's okay. The, the issue with Tamiflu is you have to start taking Tamiflu um, the day your symptoms start. Otherwise, it doesn't have an effect, right? And so if you kind of sit around and you're like, I don't know if I'm sick. Is this the cold? Is this the flu? Do I have the Rona? Eh, uh, too late. <laughs> it's now not going to work. Um, we do have vaccination for a number of viral infectious diseases. And as a recipient of those vaccines, I say thank you because I'm not worried about getting polio anymore. That's good. Um, and then mostly we have supportive care. And so supportive care literally is um, caring for the body uh, while the, uh, the body's own immune system clears the virus. So it might be something like just giving fluids, you know, when we don't feel well, we don't take great care of ourselves. Um, and we might not drink enough fluid so we could get dehydrated. So if that's just supportive care of making sure uh, we get some IV fluids to support the body, that's something. Um, all the way up to, you know, ventilatory support, kidney support, things like that, while the body is mounting an immune response against that. So that was a very, very brief intro into virology. So with that, do we have any questions from chat? Linda? Um, it looks like uh, there was a question about whether RNA viruses are all retroviruses. They are not. That's a great question. So retroviruses, this is how weird and wacky viruses are. There's all kinds of iterations as to um, how your RNA can be um, packaged, right? We have something called a positive sense RNA virus, and that just means that the RNA is looks like our RNA. Then we have negative sense RNA viruses, and that's going the wrong way down a one-way street. And then there's uh, retroviruses. Retroviruses are sneaky. They actually come into the cell with their genetic material being in the form of RNA. Then they convert themselves into a strand of DNA and then head off to the nucleus to be treated like DNA in the nucleus. They're nuts. HIV is a retrovirus. There's a number of other retroviruses, but not all RNA viruses are retroviruses. So long answer to your question for you. So we have another question about um, if a way a virus infects a cell is very specific through specific receptors, does that mean that an effective antiviral treatment is not feasible unless we alter our own DNA? So when we use antiviral drugs, um, usually we want to have an effect on the virus outside of the host cell. Usually, not always. Um, some of the HIV treatments do something different. But something like Tamiflu actually um, inhibits viral entry into the host cell. So we wouldn't need to alter any of our DNA for any of that. Um, in fact, no antivirals that I'm aware of do any kind of alteration of our own DNA. Um, you might be thinking of remdesivir, and remdesivir is, it's, it's a little, it's a drug that looks like RNA and looks like RNA bits, but isn't really RNA bits. So if you give remdesivir in the presence of um, a virus, the virus as it's replicating might try to use that drug in its replication patterns, and then that just might cause catastrophic mutation events, and then the virus will not persist. That's how it works in theory. Okay, so there's um, a few questions coming up about vaccines, about um, how long does it take to usually make a vaccine and um, whether or not, you know, some, some vaccines only work against last year's viruses and uh, how does that affect their uh, efficacy for this year's So virus? those are great questions, um, but I think we should save those virus questions for after the little virus talk. Um, those are fabulous questions, though. So we're doing more <laughs> vaccine stuff? Yeah, well, there's a whole little t mini topic on vaccine biology. Okay, and then someone wanted to review about um, spreading 
uh, viruses to other animals like dogs because they weren't sure about yeah. that. Part. So there's a, a term called viral tropism and tropism means what kinds of things can this virus infect? What kind of cells or what kind of organism? And for the most part, viruses have very narrow tropisms, meaning they can generally only infect a few cell types in one species, sometimes two species. Occasionally, we get a virus that has a very broad tropism, uh, like rabies. Rabies can infect almost all mammals, right? So there's some kind of receptor on all of our our mammalian cells that rabies uses to gain entry. But for the most part, viruses that infect people are going to be restricted to people. Viruses that infect horses are going to be restricted to horses. Now, remember when I said, though, we don't like to use those always or never terms. If you get, if you have a, a hugely infectious person, and you're slobbering all over your dog, you can transfer some virus. Now, whether or not that that is going to then replicate in your dog cells is probably not, but they can might occasionally get some kind of a transient thing. But the realistic answer is no, you're not gonna give infections to your dog for the most part, unless it's rabies. Don't give your dog rabies. Okay, I think there was another question that uh, you covered in this section about um, why, again, do antibiotics not work against viruses? They don't work specifically because these are not cells. Um, antibiotics were actually originally discovered. We like to discover antibiotics. We don't generally like to make antibiotics. And it turns out that in soil or other communities where you have a huge variety of microbes all in one area, they're kind of trying to kill off each other. And so antibiotics are a microbes way of killing off their neighbors so that they can garner all their resources. But all of those other microbes that they're trying to kill off are cellular creatures. So antibiotics are very specific to inhibiting cellular processes. And because viruses are not made out of cells, it, it just doesn't work. Ribos, um, Antibiotics that inhibit ribosomes, viruses don't have ribosomes. Antibiotics that inhibit bacterial cell walls, they don't have that. So it just doesn't work. There's a question about uh, high heat temperatures. Can those kill viruses? Let's say inactivate instead, just because there's probably some virologists somewhere in the neighborhood. Um, yeah, yeah, it does generally pretty good. High heat, you know, um, if you if you want to kill off your virus, you just boil it for a while. That generally does a pretty good trick. Different viruses require different levels of heat to be inactivated. Um, enveloped viruses, I mentioned the difference between an enveloped virus and a non-enveloped viruses. Uh, enveloped viruses, the only thing you really need to do is disrupt the envelope. So if you heat it pretty hot, especially with steam or, or you know, boiling, it's going to inactivate it pretty quick. Um, there was another question here about how does a prion simulate a virus? So prions are naughty proteins is, I think, my best way to describe them. Um, they are not viruses, but rather just misfolded proteins that then encourage other proteins to become misfolded. So, uh, so infectious kind of, if, you, if they come into contact with other similar proteins, they can cause some problems with that. Um, but they're not considered microbes because mostly they come from, you know, our own proteins become misfolded. Okay, maybe we'll just take a couple more questions for now. There's one about how do viruses mutate? Well, they mutate often and frequently and all the time. But that doesn't, like, that's not scary. I know all the um, horror movies are like, oh my gosh, the virus has mutated and it's, we're all going to die now. No, that's not how that actually goes. Um, viruses 
because they're not made out of cells, they don't have good fidelity when they're doing replication processes. So um, especially, so if we are talking about DNA viruses, DNA viruses tend to be more stable and mutate less because they rely on host cell machinery to do the replication process for them. RNA viruses mostly um, have to use their own enzymes to replicate and they're not very good. You know, they, they make a lot of mistakes. It's like having a 10 year old copy a sheet of paper, right? And say, hey, spell everything right. Eh, sometimes they're not gonna do it. So viruses mutate just because their enzymes that replicate themselves are not as good as cellular organisms. I will say though, um, that coronaviruses, um, they actually have a little enzyme that is a proofreading enzyme. So coronaviruses are much better at not mutating um, than other RNA viruses like influenza. Influenza mutates all the time. It just kind of does its own thing. Um, but coronaviruses are pretty reasonable. Um, they don't mutate a lot. Okay, so um, it seems like a lot of these uh, questions might be things that you're going to be covering in the next sections of your talk. There is one that might uh, be helpful. Someone wants to know what RNA stands for. Ribonucleic acid. So um, ribose is the sugar that makes up that molecule. So ribo means ribose. And then the nucleic acid is the phosphate and the little nucleoside that makes up the uh, uh, that molecule. Shall we go to coronaviruses? Yes, I think we should. Let's do it. I don't have my clock on right now, so I just assume we're on time. Whatever. All right, coronaviruses. All right. When you watch the news, you hear a lot about coronavirus, 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 but um, that's a huge group of viruses and they're all kind of different. So coronaviruses um, include viruses of animals and viruses of people. And I have on here uh, bats, pigs, and civet cats because they happen to have a lot of coronaviruses. Um, well, at least the bats do. But we do have coronaviruses that infect people. We all know this picture. Uh, this is SARS-CoV-2. That is the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 and our current consternation. I'm actually not going to talk about SARS-CoV-2 um, because I'm, I believe that the folks coming next month are going to talk about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. That being said, if you put SARS-CoV-2 questions in the chat, we'll try to get to some of those. I want to talk about the other myriad of coronaviruses that infect people. And in fact, let's start with cold causing coronaviruses. There are four of them. Four cold, uh, cold causing, I'm gonna stumble on that, coronaviruses, that's a lot of C's all at once. These are viruses that infect, their tropism is the upper airway tract. So um, with an upper airway tract infection, you get things like coughing, sneezing, Malaise is just a fancy word to say you don't feel well, right? So you're feeling punky, you're at home, you're coughing, you're sneezing, it's no fun, but it has a pretty darn low mortality rate or case fatality rate. Something really has to be going wrong with your own immune system for you to um, get serious disease by one of these cold causing coronaviruses. I have on here low-ish, infectivity. So infectivity is, are you going to infect other people? Are you going to transmit that to other people that might not have an immune response to it yet? And you you do. Um, if you had a cold and you went to class, you might give your cold to somebody else, right? And the immunity that we build when we're infected with these cold-causing coronaviruses um, is pretty short-term. Like if I got a cold now with a cold-causing coronavirus, um, you know, about 30% of human colds are caused by coronaviruses. The rest are caused by other viruses. But if I had a cold caused by one of the cold causing coronaviruses, I would get sick, my immune response would mount, it would clear the virus, and then I might actually get that cold again next year. So the immunity 
wanes after not a very long time. But it doesn't cause death a lot, so we're okay with that generally. We do have now three events of serious disease causing coronaviruses. We've got SARS Classic or SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, and then of course SARS-CoV-2. Starting with the archetype of severe disease causing coronaviruses. I have this little picture here. This is a civet cat. It's a little Asianic um, wild cat. It's pretty cute. SARS-CoV-1 or SARS Classic. It used to just be called SARS-CoV, but now that there's a two, they have to figure out what they're going to call it. And SARS Classic, SARS-CoV-1. I like classic, but they'll decide at some point, I'm sure. Anyways, it had the origin in a bat. Then it uh, had an intermediate host of the civet cat and then jumped into people and started the SARS outbreak. So November 2002, kind of a similar thing of how this particular pandemic started in that there was a cluster of viral pneumonia cases. Um, this was in a, a place called Guangdong province in um, China. And there was a cluster of viral pneumonia cases and it was really infectious and it became a big time outbreak. And one of the biggest problem, well, a number of problems with this outbreak, but one of the um, features of this particular outbreak is the healthcare workers were really at risk. And there are a lot of healthcare workers, unfortunately, uh, got this disease and a lot of them died of this disease. They ended up um, actually having dirty zones. So if you were a doctor or a nurse that volunteered to work in a dirty zone, that was what we would call a COVID ward now, right? That was a SARS ward then. Um, you would have to live at the hospital. You wouldn't get to go home. You had to only work on SARS patients and you stayed in that quarantine area. It wasn't until late March of 2003 that they actually identified that it was a coronavirus causing this problem. And let's let that sink in for a second. The first outbreak of this cluster of pneumonia was in November, December, January, February, March. It took four months for them to figure out it was a coronavirus. Why? This is the first time coronavirus has been demonstrated to cause severe disease in people. They were looking for influenza because everybody just assumed the next major outbreak of a respiratory pathogen was going to be influenza. Was it avian influenza? Was it H1N1? What was happening? Um, so they were looking for the wrong thing. They finally found it. Uh, they finally found SARS-CoV-1 or SARS Classic. And then they really got aggressive with it. They were able to contain it. Um, it was really aggressive, well, aggressive, but reasonable, right? Um, they had thermal scanning. So anybody that wanted to get on public transit or people that wanted to go into office buildings or children going into school, they would have their temperature taken before they went into those places. If you had um, confirmed case, you were in quarantine, they were doing aggressive contact tracing to make sure that they talked to everybody who came into contact with you. They were doing physical distancing and they were doing masking. In the end of this uh, major outbreak, there was you know, over 8,000 cases. And of those 8,000 cases, more than 800 of them proved to be fatal. And then it went away. And then it went away. It went away. It hasn't been seen um, since 2005. So the folks that are like, well, how come there isn't a SARS-1 vaccine? There's really no money in making a vaccine for a virus that doesn't really exist anymore. That's, that's what I just assume. Um, if you look at the map of where all the cases of that SARS outbreak were, most of them, so red color had the most cases, orange has the next most cases, yellow, and then down the scale. Um, most of the cases were in mainland China. However, due to a couple of super spreading events, um, it did transmit into other countries. We do have global travel now, which makes viral transmission um, a lot easier than if we were all shipping on boats to go to different countries. 
Let's talk about the disease though, and how it might be a little bit the same or different. So SARS actually stands for severe acute respiratory syndrome. And this is a lower respiratory tract pathogen. So it causes pneumonia. And actually one of the things, um, if you're looking at this x-ray here, one of the diagnostic tools that they were able to use is they would take an x-ray of the patient's lung. And if you see all that filtration, so if, you, if you're not familiar with um, how x-rays work, it's, it's shadowing on density. So the more dense something is, the lighter it is. The less dense something is, the darker it is. So air is black, bones are white, and you get a gradation. And you see all that um, inflammation in these lungs here. They call that ground glass opacification kind of looked like they were looking at ground glass in there. And so that was a really good diagnostic tool. With that, we got a lot of fever. Most people that had SARS presented with a fever, difficulty breathing, um, GI distress kind of sounds familiar, right? However, and this is really important, with SARS Classic, people were most infectious when they were symptomatic. If you had a fever, you, that's when um, you became infectious, right? So it's different now. Now you start transmitting SARS-CoV-2 before you're symptomatic. Pre-symptomatic transmission is what we're having a lot of trouble with right now. So a little bit different. Another difference is that there weren't that many um, asymptomatic cases. Most people who got the infection presented with symptoms that were bad enough that they sought medical attention, right? So they presented at urgent care or the emergency room. This had a pretty high fatality rate though. 10% of the, roughly 10% of the people who got this disease, it proved to be fatal. And kind of like our current pandemic, the older you were, the worse off it was. Um, fully half of the people that were over 75 years old succumbed to this disease. So it was pretty, pretty serious business. Um, also spread by respiratory droplets. So the wetness of our mouth, um, coughing, sneezing, spitting, speaking, things like that could transmit it. There were a number of major super spreading event where one super infectious person infected a whole bunch of people around them. Too bad. There was a little bit of evidence of fecal transmission. Um, so if you were infected and then you flush the toilet, by the way, I don't know if you know this, um, when you flush the toilet, there's like a poo plume, right? And so if, if you are infectious, it could have potentially been put into the poo plume. The immunity though, with SARS classic, lasts longer, probably. We're gonna do probably. Um, they looked at neutralizing antibodies or an immune response, you know, how long does your immunity last against it? And they, they found that five years post-infection, people still had neutralizing immunity to SARS-CoV-1. Um, they looked again after 15 years and, and it seemed to have waned. So the immunity lasts longer, but five years or 15 years, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big gap, so who knows. The next major disease causing coronavirus was MERS-CoV, another one that had origins in the bat. The intermediate was dromedary camels. Dromedary is one hump, not two. This one had a much lower transmissibility between people. SARS-CoV-1 was, you know, if you coughed on your neighbor, you were spreading a lot of virus. MERS-CoV didn't transmit person to person that well. It was droplet spread and also fomite. Fomites are considered like, if I cough on a doorknob and then you grab that doorknob and then touch your face, that doorknob would be the fomite. Um, but a lot of cases of MERS-CoV, at least early on, um, involved direct con uh, contact with the camels. So when camels are infected with this virus, uh, that starts a lot of snotty nose and stuff like that. So that's how the virus um, transmits is through the boogers of camels. And if you're the character of a camel, you could be infected that way. The outbreaks 
of MERS. And I say outbreaks because these were like small cluster outbreaks. It wasn't like SARS classic where you had one big thing and then we squashed it into oblivion. This was like spot outbreaks. There were small outbreaks in Saudi Arabia, Jordan. Um, in 2015, actually, Korea had, South Korea had an outbreak. Um, and so they tamped down pretty quickly. Sometimes with these little small scale outbreaks, um, there would be like one infected patient went into a healthcare situation and then infected the healthcare workers and other patients. And so the outbreak was kind of restricted to one healthcare place. Um, but then there was some, a little bit of transmission um, here and there. I will say though, um, that there's a license, you know, because this one's more recent and because this one actually established a reservoir in the dromedary camels, there are populations of camels um, in Africa now that just spread this virus amongst themselves. So there's now a vaccine that's been licensed for camels against MERS. And then there are, I think a couple of vaccines in clinical trial for people for MERS. So it can be done, it can be done. The disease uh, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, it's another lower respiratory tract infection, gets into your lungs, causes pneumonia. There were, mild and asymptomatic cases though. They just didn't transmit person to person very well. So if you got a mild or asymptomatic case, uh, you know, it didn't really go anywhere. Of the patients that got severe disease, almost all of them had some kind of underlying health condition though. So it was kind of postulated, <clears throat> excuse me, it was kind of postulated that maybe your, some, there had to be some kind of delay or inhibition of your own immune system to develop severe disease, to get this virus to really multiply in your cells. But if it did, and if you got severe disease, this had a crazy high mortality rate of roughly 35%, which is really unreasonable, really unreasonable. Um, so yeah, that, with that, Let's have some questions about coronaviruses that are not SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-2, that's good too. Well, there was a question about whether uh, uh, these viruses were here a long time ago. Um, so yes, but we didn't know to look. Um, there are so many hundreds of them um, that it's unreasonable to think that this is something that's just existed in the last little amount of time, um, especially ever since SARS Classic came around, they were like, huh, we should now pay attention to coronaviruses, right? If this one caused a large scale outbreak, we should now do surveillance. And so there's um, some virus hunters what a job this would be, which go into caves and sample bat populations, and they find lots and lots and lots and lots of coronaviruses. And there's actually, now that they're sampling other wildlife and um, domestic animals, they're finding more of these. So there's a lot of them. And they, you know, matriculate a lot. There's a lot of spillover events. Um, all right, so for comparison, someone was asking the mortality rate of the SARS-CoV-2. I know you're not. Yeah, so. Day, but well we might so it's tbd um until we see a full until we actually get a really robust handle on it um, i'm not willing to give a pinpoint number but it's probably one percent or lower versus ten percent for sars classic and 35 percent for mers kobe okay there's a question about why uh, sars classic went away so fast and whether it went away on its own well, we helped it along. How about that? So um, mitigation effects. So viruses, because remember, right, viruses can't replicate on their own. If you put a whole bunch of viruses in a bucket and came back later, they will not have reproduced. Um, and so if you can prevent the spread to new people that don't have immunity against it, the virus has nowhere to go and will eventually just peter out. And that's what happened with SARS-CoV-1. Um, because people were infectious, so able to transmit, when they had a fever, they were able to be like, all right, you have a fever, 
don't go to work today, you stay home, and then you won't transmit to your neighbor, and then they won't transmit to their neighbor. And so when you stop the spread like that, if the virus has nowhere to go, it will eventually be stamped out. That's what we did with smallpox, by the way. Smallpox through aggressive, like real aggressive vaccination strategy. Um, there is no such thing as natural smallpox anymore because it's just gone. It, it has no natural reservoirs in theory. So I, to cover all the bases, in theory, it could have spilled back into an animal species and is hiding out in the wilds somewhere that we don't know about. This might be something that's coming up in your next section, but there's some questions about um, how, whether coronavirus, the COVID-2 is more similar to the SARS classic or more similar to the MERS or that's what a, the difference so, is. There's a lot of, okay, so it's the same, only different as all of them. What? Um, if you look at the genetic makeup of the genome of SARS-CoV-2 versus SARS-CoV-1, they're fairly closely related and it's a little more distantly related than, uh, well, let's try that again. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 are fairly closely related as well as MERS-CoV, but SARS and um, SARS-2 share the same lock to the same key or the same key in the lock, the spike protein unlocks the same cell types. So cell types that are able to be infected with SARS-CoV-2 can be infected with SARS-CoV-1, which is different than MERS-CoV. Um, and then there's an actual, there's a couple of, a number of other coronaviruses that haven't caused disease in people that we know about, um, that they have at least isolated and identified that are closer related than any of those. Then maybe a related question is whether there's something that all coronaviruses have in common. Well, they're all positive sense strand RNA viruses that are roughly 29,000 bases long. They do have all the coronaviruses, um, at least the people infecting coronaviruses um, share a number of genetic elements. Um, they all share a, a really big genetic region that has to do with replicating enzymes. They all share the fact that they all have spike proteins. They all have membrane proteins. Um, and then they all have accessory proteins of some kind. It's just kind of the configuration of these accessory proteins that kind of isolate them into their different groups. All right, so there's a lot of questions coming up, but just to make sure that you get a chance to do the third section of your talk, maybe um, we can leave these for now and see what okay. topics still have not been covered once we get to the end. All right, I like that. Let's talk about vaccines, shall we? We're all excited. Vaccines are on the horizon somewhere. Um, but to talk about vaccines, we got to talk about what do we expect out of vaccines? Because the reason that I wanted to include this part in the talk is because I think sometimes um, we're not sure what we expect. And so we're not sure how to talk about vaccines. So ultimately, what we want vaccines to do is to prevent disease. If you're vaccinated against something, you don't want to get that something. Um, but to kind of understand what that actually means, we have to scratch the surface of immunology. And I say scratch the surface because we don't even fully 100% understand uh, the human immune system. It is very complex. However, we're going to just briefly talk about a couple of little parts. Uh, your immune response to certain things like viruses comes in th three main parts and a whole bunch of accessory parts that we're not going to talk about. Um, the innate immune response, that's kind of the immunity you get when you're first infected by something while we're waiting for the adaptive immune response to get going. So this is kind of like your first line of defense. But what we're interested in with vaccines is your adaptive immune response. And that's the immune response we get due to antibodies and something called T cells. 
antibodies are these little Y-shaped proteins and their job is to bind to things or to stick to things. And they are made by a cell type called B cells. And what we want for these antibodies, we wanna make antibodies that are specific to the virus and we want those antibodies to bind up the virus on all sides to prevent that virus from being able to infect new cells. So antibodies, especially neutralizing antibodies, are antibodies that are gonna prevent virus infection of new cells. So that's good, we like that. The other part of this is the immune response due to T cells. This is just a group of cells. Some of these T cells we call helper T cells, and they actually help B cells make better antibodies, make better antibodies that are more specific and bind more tightly to the virus. So that's good, helper T cells. The other group of T cells that we talk about are killer, T they're actually called killer T cells. I mean, talk about the perfect name because their job as killer T cells are to kill virally infected cells. So cells that already became infected. Um, the idea is that if these T cells kill a virus infected cell, those viruses within the cell will not be infectious because they're not complete yet. They're not totally completely made. Um, so it works out pretty good. So ultimately, right, going back into vaccines and how that works with vaccines, um, if we use vaccines to stimulate neutralizing antibodies and stimulate the activity of these T cells, we should be pretty well off. We should do pretty well. But remember that first slide from the get-go, it's not always or never. So the different types of immunity that we get from these vaccines, ideally in a perfect world, a vaccine will cause something called sterilizing immunity. And sterilizing immunity is so great immunity that your cells won't even become infected at all. We achieve that, when I say we, I mean those people before me, not me, um, smallpox vaccine did a decent job of stimulating sterilizing immunity. If you got a smallpox vaccine and then you got hit in the face with some smallpox, you wouldn't get infected. You wouldn't be able to transmit. You would not show any symptoms of any kind of disease. Everything would be perfect. Much more common to that, that's really rare, much more common to that is the prevention of disease. Like my polio vaccine that I got when I was a kid. Um, it's injectable. Um, the IPV is inactive polio vaccine. Um, and when I got that vaccine, I mounted an immune response, I will not get polio. But if I got hit full of a face full of polio, um, that virus might replicate in my GI tract and I might be able to transmit it to somebody who was not vaccinated. And then also common is the prevention of severe disease, right? So our influenza vaccines that we get, in some people, you won't get infected at all. And some people, if you get your vaccine, your flu shot, um, you won't get the flu ever. You won't get any symptoms, not a problem. Um, but for a lot of people, it will at least keep them out of the hospital. You might, if you get hit with a face full of flu, um, you might feel punky and have to stay home for a few days, but that's much better than developing severe pneumonia and ending up in the hospital. So what do we expect out of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines? That's a big I don't know. TBD, they're coming. I will say that there are 200 plus um, vaccine platforms that are coming and it just depends on how they all work. The groups or the types of vaccines that are being researched right now some of them are whole virus vaccines. So using the entirety of the virus, either through passaging or whatever, attenuating it, making it not disease causing anymore, or by boiling it or adding a chemical to it to inactivate it. If you use that as a vaccine, you will probably elicit a pretty good immune response, fingers crossed. There are a bunch of viral vector vaccines. So a vector vaccine, is using the backbone of a different virus. In many cases, at least with this grouping, um, the backbone is a, an adenovirus, which causes colds in people. And so they take the gene for spike protein 
clone it into this other vector. Sometimes they're able to replicate in human cells, sometimes they're not, and use that as a vaccine to elicit good immunity. <clears throat> Sometimes they use a subunit vaccine. So this is like if I were to take that spike, purify it, and then grow it up a whole bunch, purify just that protein, and use that as a vaccine, I should mount an immune response against spike. And then there are the new fancy ones, DNA and RNA vaccines, where you take just genes, like the gene for spike protein, and use that as a vaccine. So um, there's what 200 plus platforms that are being studied right now, probably 10 are in at least clinical studies in humans. Um, the top couple candidates, um, both Moderna and Pfizer have vaccine candidates that are in phase, almost done populating phase three. So their phase three trial is 30,000 patients strong. So they're enrolling 30,000 people for the vaccine trial. Both Moderna and Pfizer are mRNA vaccines. So Moderna is using the full length piece of RNA that encodes for the full length spike protein. And Pfizer, that candidate is using just the receptor bind. So just like the knobby head of spike protein as their vaccine candidate. Um, and they're almost they are almost all the way populated their 30,000 trials. So there are two doses though. So let's see if they populate that trial now, then you have to get a booster shot in three weeks or a month, depending on the vaccine. And then, you know, your clock starts. Johnson & Johnson, if you've been watching the news, Johnson & Johnson just announced that they are entering into their phase three clinical trials. So phase three are like efficacy trials to see if it actually works. Phase one and phase two are to make sure it's safe. Um, so Johnson & Johnson's phase three trial will include 60,000 participants. That one is a vector vaccine using an adenovirus vector that does not replicate in human cells. Um, and they're hoping to get theirs single dose is the thumbs up. So it's a race now. We're gonna need multiple candidates to work out, but let's have some questions about vaccines. I am sure there's plenty. Okay, so um, I guess a lot of people are very concerned about the timeline for developing a vaccine. I know it seems like we're, you know, pretty far along altogether. Yes. What do you think the timeline is for getting a vaccine developed? Well, so those three that I mentioned by name are the furthest along in that they're populating their phase three trial. So in vaccine development, you have a whole bunch of preclinical trial work that has to be done, but none of the vaccine platforms are completely untried, untested platforms. They're modifications of platforms that we've used for other vaccines for other things. So a lot of the um, safety stuff has already been done for the platform. So now it's just the making sure the modifications are safe. So phase one trials and phase two trials are all about making sure it's safe to give to people. The phase three trials are, let's not only make sure they're safe, Let's make sure it works. Now, normally um, a phase three might take one to four years. They'd follow those patients for one to four years. That's a long time and people are dying right now. Um, so they're, they're saying, okay, everybody's seeking full approval. Like all of these vaccine companies are saying, we're gonna do all of the work. However, if our early data says it's safe, and it's effective, then we'll go ahead and get the emergency youth authorization. And while we're still watching this group, you guys can already start getting the vaccine. So in realistic terms, um, if you think about how, at least the early data, right? They have to vaccinate the people. They then have to, in most cases, give them a booster shot in a month. And then they have to see if it's effective. Um, so that's going to take some time. Once they determine it is, if now I will say the one thing that is amazing with this pandemic is they're using somebody else. Well, I mean, it's taxpayers' money, but I mean, um, you know, take my money because I want the vaccine at some point. Um, 
they're already building the factories to mass produce the vaccines for once the data is in. So normally, once you get clearance for a vaccine, there's a huge lag time for production. I mean, years for production. Then it rolls out. They're kind of doing these things in parallel and saying, okay, it's safe. It works. Great. We've already got some. And then they'll distribute them. That's still going to take a long time. I mean, there's you know, what, seven and a half billion people on the planet, eight billion people on the planet. And if you need to give two doses to everybody who wants one, that's a lot of doses. That's a lot of doses. Um, so hopefully 2021 is going to be a good year. Hopefully. I guess sort of related to what you were saying before, um, is there any, is there a process where once they're to test for efficacy, do they try to expose these people now to the virus on purpose to see if they get sick or not? Is that something that's that, done? That would be quite unethical with a virus that kills people. So no, <laughs> but there's enough. Um, when they're designing who is going to be a part of this um, process, who's going to be in their trials, right? Because if everybody applies, they don't just take everybody. They select people that live in areas and, and have jobs or have, you know, are living lives that might become exposed naturally, right? There's enough coronaviruses, there's enough SARS-CoV-2 out there that you can populate your study with people that are at risk of getting naturally infected. But then you just sit back and wait and see who gets infected and who doesn't get infected. And that does take a little bit of time. What you're talking about, or the questioner was talking about is a challenge trial. And that's um, things that you can maybe do with a research animal, but you can't do that on people <laughs> in a deadly virus. Then there's also some question about whether uh, the fast track is that, uh, how is that affecting the vaccine and um, whether it would uh, affect how safety. well it should be able to work and its safety, yeah. So what they're, the fast track is mostly just paralleling things rather than getting rid of things. Um, they're not getting rid of any of the safety checks. They're not getting rid of any of the data collection. What they're generally doing is saying, instead of getting your data from phase one, then writing your data and submitting it, and then it sits at FDA for six months, and then they say, okay, now you can start phase two, and then you design phase two, and then you do phase two, and then you submit. Like there's a lot of lag normally and so what they've done is they're like, all right, we're going to say we're prioritizing this. If you come to us with a vaccine proposal, we're going to look at it right then rather than putting it at the end of the line. Um, and they're already starting with the manufacturing part so that they're ready to deploy when they come. So it's more of a paralleling and getting rid of the lag and not getting rid of the safety checks. All right. There were some uh, questions earlier. I was trying to take notes on some of these questions that are scrolling by. A lot of people were asking about taking vitamins and whether that helps uh, increase your chances of um, so immunity. I, I, I hear a lot of vitamin C and vitamin D. Um, there, there's no peer-reviewed published control studies. Um, so, so a lot of times if you want to say this drug works this well, then you'll take a group of people, you'll give half of them the drug and you won't give half of them the drug and we'll see what their outcomes are. And that, and, and, and a, in a blinded study, the physician doesn't know, the patients don't know who's getting the placebo versus who's getting the actual drug. And that way there's no bias in, well, I'm gonna take care of these patients better because they're getting the drug. And there's some other biases there. Um, so in a controlled study, there haven't been any controlled studies that show vitamin D or, or vitamin C really do anything? All right, there's a question also about um, how long the efficacy of the vaccine would last. Would it need to be that's something taken every That's an amazing question. <laughs> that's a, so that's an amazing question and we won't know that until we get to that time. Um, if, you know, you can look at it in two ways, right? Are we gonna go the cold virus, corona, where you have to kind of get a vaccine maybe every year, or are we going to have longer term immunity, maybe five years, maybe 10 years? We have to get to those points. You know, this, this virus is 10 months old <laughs> in this current iteration. So 
that's all the data we have for it. There's some also some questions about uh, bats, whether bats are infected by it or whether they're just carriers. So people were interested yeah. in that. Bat immunology is crazy town, right? Because these are mammals that are adapted for flying. So their metabolism is nutty. Um, and so a lot of times viruses that cause disease in other animals, they tolerate based on their immunological factors. Um, so for the most part, they are just carriers of these viruses. However, um, there is some minor diseases, some sniffly noses and things like that with some of them. Oh, Fort Collins, cool. University of Colorado, Fort Collins has a bat colony for steady, steady beans. Ah. There was also a question coming up uh, whether interferon works against the SARS-CoV-2 or yeah, so interfere. So um, part of the disease problems, and so I hope all of you guys come back next month when the public health people come, and I hope they talk about actual SARS-CoV-2. Um, the disease progression of SARS-CoV-2 is, you know, you get the virus, it spends time multiplying in your cells, and then actually you have a peak, and then it starts going down a virus but your immune response starts going wonky. So it becomes dysregulated. Um, part of that is through chemicals like interferons and other um, uh, chemical messengers that cause um, a dysregularity of your immune response. So interferon, um, you know, there's, there's some, some studies going on looking at um, immune modulating drugs where if you can bind up certain chemicals of the immune system, can you, prevent people from getting severe disease. So some of the, um, there's some monoclonal antibodies that affect immune cells. There's uh, something called tocilizumab that binds up IL-6, interleukin-6, which is a chemical that causes some dysregulation. Um, so the answer is maybe. Um, I do think that there's some, gonna be some trials coming up looking at effects of immune modulators. There's already some trials going on. Um, there's also a question about uh, how many people would have to get the vaccine in order to get a good immune response in the community. Yeah, that's a good question, too, because um, you're going to have to kind of battle it between the people who are already naturally infected and how long their immune responses last versus the people who get I mean, ultimately, right, we want to talk about quote unquote herd immunity. And the problem is, unless we're talking about a vaccine that causes sterilizing immunity, um, if you got the vaccine and it was just a, a disease prevention vaccine, so the virus could still multiply in your cells, you could still transmit it to somebody who's not vaccinated. So ideally, we would want to vaccinate, you know, 75 to 85% of the population to really get a control on it. But um, TBD on it also depends on how effective the vaccines are, right? FDA says that they will approve anything that's efficacy is over 50%. The vaccine companies say that they're seeking or, or only looking at 80% and better efficacy. So it just depends on how they work out. All right, I think maybe we should just have one more uh, question about the vaccines and probably end up, there's been a lot of very interesting chat. So thank you very much for being so active in your chat. Um, maybe one on if you have had the COVID-19 and you already got over it, would you still need a vaccine for it at that point? That's a good question. Um, and it depends. And I don't think we actually, you know, I don't think that's really known. It's going to depend on how long natural immunity probably lasts. You know, if natural immunity only lasts a year, well, by the time your year is up, you're going to probably want to get in the vaccine line. Otherwise, you're going to be at risk again. Um, if your natural immunity lasts longer, then you might not. So um, I don't really know if that's a known thing at this point. All right, well, I wanted to just remind people that um, this, the recording of the talk will be up on the Great Valley Museum YouTube page. And then um, if Catherine wanted to close out, we probably should start closing up since it's already 8.40. Oh, sorry. I, I okay. tried to condense, it wasn't gonna happen. No, it's all the great questions we've been getting. Right.
Thank you everybody yes. for coming to my talk. Well, thank you, Dr. Lucas, for giving us such a great presentation and really making virology something that we all can better understand now and have a, a more mastery of what we hear in the news and, and feel better prepared for next month's presentation. So mark your calendars, everybody, because on October 30th, we're going to have an epidemiology team here to continue the conversation about COVID-19. Thank you for your attendance.